thank you very much for the very beginning for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here and see so many people around the globe. So uh, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. And um, yeah, I will directly start with my presentation. I hope you can see it. Uh, if not, let me know. So um, what I'm gonna talk today is about the neural circuit physiology of learning motivation and decision-making. And that's basically a, yeah, a overview about our research that we, um, that we did over the last years at the Leibniz Institute in uh, Magdeburg, Germany. And as Micha pointed out, currently I'm also establishing my lab at the medical school in Berlin. So <clears throat> what are we interested in? We are interested in um, the uh, cortical physiology in uh, rodents, in freely moving behaving animals. Can you hear me? Ah, okay, sorry, I think there was a problem with my um, um, microphone. So what we do is we, uh, we investigate um, um, uh, freely moving rodents. So what we do is we use uh, um, electrophysiological recordings. So we stick an electrode to the brain of the, the rodent and then we basically record here the signals of hundreds of thousands of neurons in the auditory cortex. So that is the region in the brain which is basically known to process sound. So whenever you hear a certain sound, this auditory cortex is activated by the sound coming to your hair cells. And then there is a neuronal activity that is transmitted until this region of the auditory cortex. The auditory cortex is the region which we know is um, uh, used or, or necessary for having auditory perceptions. So what we basically do is that we, um, we use multi-channel recordings as you see that here and this little cartoon illustrates how we map synaptic activity and synaptic populations in the auditory cortex with a method called current source density distribution. So wherever there is a synaptic contact between a pre and a post synaptic neuron, there is um, positive charges going into the cell so in the outer field, there is a net negativity, which we basically map by this uh, current sink here depicted in uh, blue. And this is supported by current sources in red. And then over time and across space, we are able to map the, the, the entire synaptic activity within this complex circuit of the auditory cortex. So whenever you see such kind of patterns, this is across space and time, the activity of synaptic populations across different layers of this layered structure of the auditory cortex, uh, which basically gives rise to the complex architecture as you see that here. So what we use then is certain aspects or methods of circuit manipulations from optogenetics, we use laser induced cell death or the removal of um, the sugar networks between neurons, the exocellular matrix. Today, we will focus on the method of, uh, of optogenetics, which I will introduce um, later. And that set of techniques allows us basically to, um, um, to have a look on different observational levels. So how does the brain process auditory stimuli? How does perception basically arises out of this pattern? And how is that pattern also related to decision-making, learning and memory? So these are the key questions we, we have in our lab. Today, I would like to focus on this key question. Um, key question, so does the auditory cortex represent auditory stimulus features and also task-dependent information? So that is something uh, where the field was moving to over the last years. We know that the auditory cortex is necessary for sound processing, but how much of actually more cognitive um, uh, uh, um, variables is actually represented in the auditory cortex? So is there a representation of, for instance, the choice behavior that we see in these animals? Um, just to let you know how we uh, brain scientists think about the brain, we think that the brain is an hypothesis testing organ. So that's the way we basically work. It's not a, a, a left in, right out black box. It's more a try and see organ. 
And whenever, um, uh, so we build hypotheses about the world and whenever our expectation is not, met, not matching uh, what we basically see, so the level of reality does not uh, correspond to the level of expectation, there is something happening in our brain. There is a, a neurotransmitter system that is activated and this is our internal prediction error system. And in the first part of the um, talk, I would like to, um, to tell you a bit about this internal prediction error system, which is basically related to a transmitter called dopamine. So in that first part, we would like to have a look on dopamine. What is the role of dopamine and how does that actually affect this complex circuit processing in the auditory cortex? So first of all, um, in, um, in this experiment here, I'll show you how we basically investigate the behavior of a Mongolian gerbil. You will hear a sound. I hope it was not too loud. So it was a rising sound where the animal knows, okay, now I have to cross over this hurdle in this box to avoid um, a mild food shock. And there is another situation where the animal hears another sound, which basically is a falling sound. It goes to the hurdle, but it has learned, okay, at that sound, you have to stay on that side. And we call that discrimination learning. It's like if you cross the street, red means you have to stop, green means you have to walk. So what, what animals learn basically over training sessions is to, um, to uh, uh, understand the learning rule and they're able to basically perform in accordance to this learning rule. And what we can see is that at the very beginning of the um, learning, there's an increase of dopamine levels while when the animal has acquired already a, an, an established learning performance, the dopamine level goes down again. So it seems that the dopamine is triggering this initial learning, but not as much of the, um, let's say, pronounced training to get very, very good at the end. So it's more like the start of the training or the start of the learning, which we call acquisition learning. What you can do is <clears throat> you can basically talk to the animals a bit and just turn around the learning rule from one day to the other. So let's say red now means you have to walk, green, you have to stay. So uh, we call that relearning. And of course, what happens is the learning rule the animals had um, is not accurate anymore. They drop in performance. It costs them a couple of training days to get again on a certain level of uh, training performance. And again, you see, whenever there is a switch in the world, there's an internal uh, wrong prediction. So the learning rule the animal had before is not correct anymore. Again, this internal uh, prediction error system is activated, dopamine is released, and when the animal then acquires again good performance, the dopamine goes back to the baseline. So long story short, that means dopamine is uh, the neurochemical mediator of this kind of uncertainty. So whenever there is um, a mismatch between the level of expectation and what you observe, the level of reality, dopamine is released and it basically sets the tune for adapting your behavior, adapting your choice, so what we would call learning. That is known for quite a while, but um, what actually is the question or was the question is how does that affect the neuronal circuit processing of the auditory cortex? So if you learn about a sound, how do neurons basically reconnect to represent that a certain sound has a certain meaning? And uh, here um, comes work from uh, Michael Brunk into the picture. We had a collaboration together with Michael Lippert from uh, the Leibniz Institute in um, Magdeburg. And what um, Michael Brunk basically did is he uh, transduced the, um, the dopaminergic cell system, so this reward system in the brain from the so-called ventral tegmental area with a virus and let animals self-stimulate with a laser the, uh, the dopaminergic neurons that by this optogenetic construct were basically able to be activated by laser light. And what happens if you do this, this you will see in this little video here. So this gerbil here that you see um, basically has that genetic manipulation. Whenever it presses a lever, it shines light into its reward center. And you see that this gerbil presses the lever uh, and would not stop pressing the lever until you take it out because it's like a super strong reward and the animal just sits there and presses the lever all day long. <clears throat> so what we have basically shown is that 
when you stimulate the VTA, there is a connection from the VTA directly to the auditory cortex. So that's basically what you see here. There are projections from the dopaminergic uh, reward centers that go directly to the auditory cortex. So there must be a dopaminergic input that the animals basically drive by pressing the lever that also reaches the auditory cortex. Um, what we then did is we basically combined the stimulation of the reward center and of the auditory pathway. And uh, what you basically see here is that that's again this pattern across space and time, how the auditory cortex is activated by a sound. Uh, so you play a sound and obviously you see a response in the auditory cortex because this, that's the region where sound is processed. But that is an untreated animal just sitting around and hearing a tone. What does actually happen if you uh, combine the tone input and also the dopaminergic input? Um, and if you do that, you basically see that by the combination of both, you see a very strong and, and uh, a pronounced input processing of sound, which is boosted by this additional um, activation of the dopamine system. And what we basically were able to show is that when you, uh, when you um, stimulate the, um, the, the VTA, you see an increase in the processing. So compare the blue curve and the red curve. So there's an increase in the processing. However, most important is that this is not only in the moment where you stimulate the dopamine system, but that was activated or, or prolonged even over more than half an hour. So you stimulate the VTA once you have a release of dopamine, and that increases the processing over a certain time window, which lasts longer than half an hour. So for longer than half an hour, you have an increased activation of the neuronal circuits. And what we think is that dopamine basically plays a role as a teaching signal. So you in, in, uh, induce a local gain of sensory input. So you have a stronger processing of, of sensory events just because you also activated the dopamine system. <clears throat> And that this strengthening of synaptic processing is even prolonged longer than the actual activation of the dopamine system. How could that be? We believe that the dopamine sits on certain receptors and uh, is basically activating these receptors over a certain time amount until dopamine is really, again, um, um, uh, um, released from the receptors and um, uh, uh, circulates back to the synaptic terminals. And over that certain period of time, you have a prolonged strengthening of synaptic processing. That makes also sense to a certain degree, because if there is something happening which, uh, which does not match your, your expectation, you basically need to be, uh, combine and integrate different, um, different events in your environment to combine it and basically learn what were the circumstances currently in the world that led to this wrong expectation and how would you need to reframe your world model so that it would match um, uh, uh, your expectation in, in the next situation, which basically is the essence of learning. You have to combine different events in the outer world which are not uh, happening at the very same moment, but which may also be um, separated in time. And dopamine seems to be the neurochemical transmitter that allows neurons to basically do that. Okay, so um, this was a, a study where we, uh, where we just combined technically, if you want, a dopamine signal, which was not related to, to the behavior of the animal itself, but it was like, if you want, like a Pavlovian conditioning, you activate the dopamine signal and you present a sound and you see what the brain basically is doing out of it. The next step um, that we basically were, uh, were interested in, how does that actually look like in a learning behaving animal once the animal basically walks around and solves a certain task? And um, in this second part of the talk, I would like to uh, present work from uh, Marina Sempelsi and colleagues of our lab where we were uh, using these Mongolian gerbils in such a shuttle box. So the animals had to cross such a hurdle and were basically yeah, forced with the decision, should I jump over the hurdle or not? Should I stay or cross? And while the animals were doing this, we were recording again 
these uh, multi-channel um, recordings from um, across all the cortical layers so that you get information about the entire circuitry, so across space and time. And um, <clears throat> then um, we basically, while the animals were doing this, we were also having um, video recordings of these animals. So here you see an animal crossing over the hurdle. That was a wrong decision, received a mild food shock, went back to the other side. And you can see here that we had information about the, um, the circuit processing on a trial by trial level. So each decision the animal was doing, we were basically able to calculate the, the, the entire circuit processing. So with this information we basically gathered here from each single decision of the animal, we were basically able to uh, ask the question, okay, how does it actually um, uh, change the processing in the auditory cortex when the animal is forced with different learning rules? So what we had is in a first phase, we had two different tone signals, a sine wave of one kilohertz and a sound that is a bit higher, like four kilohertz. And we trained the animal um, with the learning rule that each of these stimuli was a go stimulus. That means each of the stimuli were basically, um, the animal had to cross the hurdle. So whether it's a low frequency or mid frequency sound, the rule was, if you hear the sound, you have to cross over the other side. And uh, this is basically what we would call a detection learning. So it doesn't matter what kind of sound you hear, whenever you detect a sound, cross the hurdle. And if you, um, if you now have a look on how does the auditory cortex basically treats these two different signals, which have the same meaning, then you see that during this detection, uh, the one kilohertz sound and the four kilohertz sound, uh, if you compare these patterns, you see that they are pretty much comparable. So again, what you see is across uh, space and across time. And whenever you see a, a current sink, so such a blue, blue dot here, that basically means at that position, at that time point, there was a synaptic population that was active. So here there was a synaptic population active in the depth of let's say 1.2 millimeters. And in this uh, case of the other sound, there's a very comparable activation of this synaptic population. So this is the way you basically can compare these two different patterns. And you see that the spatial temporal profile of the entire synaptic network was pretty comparable, although the sounds were different. So um, <clears throat> that was kind of a surprise because actually it's believed that the auditory cortex represents like a topographic map of the sound environment, like a, like a piano, if you want, so that each region would correspond to a certain sound frequency. When you do this in an anesthetized animal, it's indeed what you see. Yeah? There is a topographical uh, organization of sound frequencies across the entire space. So you normally would not see the same response to do two different uh, sound frequencies at the very same position. However, in an animal that solved this task, this detection task, we basically exactly found this, that when the, the, the sound is not different in its meaning, also the processing in the auditor, um, auditory cortex was not different. Um, so if that's the hypothesis that the meaning of the sound uh, corresponds to what you see uh, uh, as activity of the auditory cortex, we basically um, had a second training phase where we did the following. We left the um, we left the uh, the contingency of one sound the same. So let's say one kilohertz stayed as a go signal. So nothing changed. Um, while we switched the um, the the meaning or the contingency of the other sound to a no go sound. So in the first phase, the animal was crossing to both of the stimuli, and the second phase it has to learn still cross for one stimulus, but now you have to stick on your side and stay on your side for the other stimulus. So from a detection in phase one, we came to a discrimination training in phase two. So now that means that the, 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 the contingency of the stimuli differed, the meaning of the stimuli differed, and also the task rule if you want. Uh, so now it's important, you have to listen to the sound, 
In the first phase, it was not important what sound you hear because you have to cross anyways. But now it's important that you really listen what sound was actually played. And in that second training phase, how would the auditory cortex represent now the physically exactly the same frequencies? And this is what you see here. So there is no change in the stimulus frequency that the auditory cortex processes. And if only stimulus frequency would um, would lead to the activity of the auditory cortex, there should not be a difference. But you see that the change of the learning rule and the change of the contingency dramatically changed how the auditory cortex processed the, the physically same stimuli. So you see here the one kilohertz that stayed as a go signal. And you see, basically, if you compare this with how the auditory cortex processed one kilohertz in the first phase, there is a very strong increase of the overall activity, while for the four kilohertz, which is now a no-go stimulus, uh, so it changes um, um, its, its, its meaning compared to the first phase, there is a reduction of the activity, so there's an inhibition of the, of the uh, sound-evoked activity of the auditory cortex, while you see a strong increase when the animal sees, okay, this is a go signal. What do we make out of it? So basically what we uh, uh, found is that in this first detection phase, when the animal was uh, answering correctly, so it was crossing the hurdle for both of the stimuli, we found a strong increase of activity, of sound evoked activity, while in the incorrect trials, there was a um, not as strong activity. So it seems that whenever the sound was basically telling the animal, you have to cross over the hurdle, there was an increase in the, um, in, in the sound evoked component. While in this discrimination learning, we found also something interesting, namely for the incorrect um, uh, trials where the animal was not crossing or was crossing wrongly, there was no difference between the two stimuli. So when the auditory cortex was not able to discriminate between the two signals, also the choice of the animal was wrong. While when the animal did the correct thing, we found there was an increase for the correct go trials where the animal correctly crossed over the hurdle. And there was a reduction of the correct trials where the animal stayed on the right side. So that means the auditory cortex does not merely reflect sound processing. That is something which is, I think, our uh, data clearly shows. Uh, the auditory cortex is way more than a physical uh, uh, um, a sound re representation uh, 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 region of the brain. And it reflects behavioral relevance. Um, basically, when the animal understood this sound is behaviorally relevant for me, I have to do something, I have to act, then you see an increase in the overall activity strength. And also it was able to basically predict the correct choice. Um, because if you basically see here, when the animal was actively crossing or actively staying, this is where the cortex had the strongest discrimination between the physically same sound frequencies. So that means um, the task rule and the choice of the animal is reflected in the activity patterns in um, a, 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 a region as the auditory cortex, which basically sits at the very beginning of the sensory hierarchy. So this idea that there is, um, there is one region necessary for uh, the processing of the uh, sensory environment, and then it passes the information to another region, which would uh, create an action outcome um, uh, uh, strategy, which would then pass the information to a system that, uh, that promotes the motor signals to get your muscles moving. That's something that we more and more learn is, is, is not the accurate way in understanding the brain. Basically, there is a tendency of this shift between sensory versus cognitive versus motor representation, but you do see this kind of information is distributed across the entire brain. So even the sensory cortex is a very early um, uh, brain region involved in sensory processing is also uh, a strongly reflecting task-related information and cognitive aspects of a choice procedure. 
Um, and for the very experts, uh, what we also did is we used statistical modeling with uh, generalized linear models, and we fed uh, now information of specific layers to basically even better understand what exact um, uh, uh, circuit components would serve for the one or the other decision of the animal. And what we found is that we were able to predict the correct choice of the animal from the uh, uh, processing of respective layers. And that this was even able across um, uh, certain seconds before the animal is actually doing its correct or incorrect decision. So that means if you take the, 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 the brain signals, you can basically trace back um, uh, trace back here. This is basically uh, not seconds, but one and a half seconds. So that's one and a half, um, three, four and a half seconds. And over this time period, you can even see that more and more the activity of the brain resembles the correct decision. Um, that means there is not a one certain moment where an animal is making its own decision, but it's like an accumulating evidence that is reflected in the population activity of the auditory cortex. Once it's crossing a certain um, threshold, then the animal basically starts to, to make its uh, choice. Okay, and um, yeah, with this, I would like to um, frame this again into that framework we had uh, uh, a look at uh, before in this try and see phenomenon. So if the level of reality does not match the level of expectation, we were basically seeing that now the dopamine system uh, is recruited and activated. So there is a release of dopamine and that basically, first of all, would go to the entire brain. So not only the auditory cortex, but to any kind of region. And wherever there is uh, um, a neuronal activity that could basically be important for understanding where your lack of expectation and reality comes from. So dopamine would uh, increase and enhance the activity of these synaptic circuits that are active in that very specific moment. And that would then create basically um, that synaptic weights can change and adapt which is the fundamental uh, uh, routine, uh, the, the, the fundamental circuit routine of learning. Yeah? So you change the weights of synaptic activity patterns, and by this you would adapt to a certain situation, which means you basically learn to, uh, to pr predict the world in a different manner in the next situation. So um, what we have seen is that dopamine is a prediction signal or an error signal, which then basically is used as a teaching signal for the neural elements. And that is um, uh, the fundament for learning related plasticity by first a local gain of sensory input. So you basically increase the activity that is, uh, that, that is activated by a certain uh, sensory input, like a sound. And that basically then is broadcasted to broad cortical cortical networks so that the brain could reconnect in a certain manner to reflect um, the behavioral relevance of a certain signal. And by this, we are able to see that dopamine is, um, is a, um, yeah, a change of a network mode that allows to integrate the bottom up sensory information but also, and that is the fundamental importance, the top-down information. Yeah? Because like for instance, reflecting the task rule, while there is no change of the physical stimuli, but there is a new task rule, you basically have to have this cognitive concept in mind. This time there is not a detection learning, but I have to discriminate two sounds for instance. So you need to somehow integrate the bottom-up information and the top-down information. And that is something which is basically um, arranged by the neurotransmitter dopamine in that um, um, circuit system like the auditory cortex, as you see that here. Okay, so um, basically that is uh, that was one of the core projects of our research group. And uh, um, lastly, I would not uh, like to miss to uh, also show you some other projects at, at least to a certain superficial level. Um, so all together, we are interested in the uh, circuits of the auditory system um, during learning and memory. 
And um, what we were working on over the last um, years is that we uh, developed several different other aspects of uh, behavioral paradigms. So for instance, currently we are also interested in the frontal cortex and its role during attention. So we have it, um, a box, as you see that here, we have two spouts where an animal can get some food and basically it has to forage and search for food on these two spouts. And there is an exponential decay of the success rate. So at some point the animal gets some food here and it depletes and at a certain moment in time, it will decide, okay, here I am I'm not successfully searching for food anymore. So I have to cross through this labyrinth to another source and now search for food on this side. And we also want to see how basically the underlying circuit activity reflects the decision in time when the animal says, okay, now I need to search on the other side. And that's a current project that we uh, run um, uh, with the University of Magdeburg and the Leibniz Institute in Magdeburg. With these patterns and also the video material that you have seen before, that's also one of the projects that uh, Misha was um, um, for, uh, um, bringing forward a lot. We want to also feed computational modeling and reinforcement learning models in collaboration with Gerhard Jochum at the University of Düsseldorf and basically want to find out what kind of movement patterns of the animal would also correspond to certain aspects of neuronal processing. There is um, a lot of activity going on in this field to basically map the really uh, a trial by trial behavior of a mouse. And you can really uh, uh, um, predict by, um, by head movements, by certain aspects of the body movement, what the animal will basically do next and in which uh, learning um, phase the animal is in. And we also try to, um, yeah, to basically bring these uh, aspects together from the electrophysiological part, the behavioral part, and um, the video material. We have talked about optogenetics and um, we have basically seen this experiment where we shine light into the um, a brain region with dopamine neurons. You are able to activate these neurons. These neurons would fire. So dopamine would released over the entire brain. What we um, also uh, have, um, um, there are different opportunities to use optogenetic constructs to do different other things. So for instance, in collaboration with Professor Martin Heine in Mainz, we have an um, optogenetic tool to cluster certain molecules in, 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 in a synapse. So normally you have between the pre and post synapse, there are calcium receptors, which are necessary for the vesicle release from the pre to the post synapse. And these calcium channels in the pre synapse, they are um, uh, laterally moving around, and that's necessary for the activity of the synaptic um, boutons. And we can basically cluster them and hold them in place. So you would basically not activate these cells or synapses, but you would switch their, their certain microphysiology. Yeah? This will create a change in the firing characteristics of these neurons. And um, this is also something where we are interested in basically understand what is the role of um, molecular subdomain dynamics for neuronal processing and also for um, how these animals basically then perceive sound in the world. And um, together with the university clinics in Erlangen, we try to also relate this to translational questions where we're interested in how a central noise trauma like you would have them on, I don't know, after a rock concert or so, what does it actually uh, create? Um, so we know that there is the, the risk of deafness, the risk of tinnitus, and we want to understand um, what kind of central changes, and this is also kind of plasticity, if you want, happens if there, uh, there are noise traumas. And lately we also, together with Michael Brunk, actually had a paper about genetic disorders and um, how this is related to developmental hearing loss. So that's just like a brief overview of uh, different other projects we have uh, in our research group going on. And yeah, with this, I'm happy to, um, to show this slide as uh, it's always the case. This is nothing that one person can do alone. You see here, this is like our core research group as it was, um, yeah, let's say two years ago, 
there is um, still Micha Brunk, and uh, today we have a, um, a group of PhD students and master students in Magdeburg. The lab is transforming to Berlin, but this is like the core group of people that was responsible for all these um, projects that I um, introduced today. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to also answer some questions. Thanks a lot. Many thanks, Max, to this magnificent, magnificent talk. Sorry. Um, yeah, you can type in your questions still in the chat box. We currently have two questions that I would like to read out. The first one is, what is the mechanism for the prolonged maintenance of dopamine-induced changes in cortical activity? Uh, sorry, could, could you repeat the question? I, there was a, a click in there. Okay, so what is the mechanism for the prolonged maintenance of dopamine-induced changes in cortical activity? Yeah, mm -hmm. very good question. So it is um, believed that the, the dopamine, once it is released from uh, the, the presynaptic terminals, and then they would go from this VTA region to all regions of the brain. So um, the strongest projections would go to the prefrontal cortex, but there are also other projections to sensory cortices, to other regions in the brain. And when you stimulate the dopaminergic neurons, they would fire, they would release dopamine. And wherever dopamine is released, of course, on the postsynaptic side, there would be receptors where the dopamine could, um, could bind to. And um, then it then it's like a, 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 a mechanism with a key. Once you have um, a, a door and a key and you pull it together, you can open the door. As long as dopamine sits on the receptor, this will change the processing of the postsynaptic cell. And it's believed that the binding of dopamine onto certain receptor types, like for instance, D1, D5 or D2 receptors, that's something which is not the transmitter binds and then goes off again, but it sits on the receptor for a certain amount of time until it will remove again from the receptor. And as long as the dopamine binds to the receptor, as long would you have a, C and a change of the processing of the postsynaptic cells. And it's believed, um, believed that um, the dopamine would sit on these receptors over time period of let's say half an hour, and by this, you have such a long change of the synaptic processing after dopamine release. Good. The next question would be, what is the relationship between NMDNA, uh, sorry, NMDA and dopamine in synaptic waiting? Excellent question. Um, so, uh, well, NMDA is a certain type of glutamate receptor and it's, um, there's, uh, you have two main receptor types of glutamate in the brain. One is the AMPA receptor and the other is the NMDA. AMPA is this kind of receptor as said before, you have the receptor, you have glutamate, glutamate binds, you have a um, channel opening, ions going into the cell, cell depolarizes, glutamate is going off the receptor, milliseconds range. This NMDA receptor is kind of special. The NMDA receptor has a, a magnesium ion that sits in the channel pore and blocks the channel. So if uh, glutamate is coming to the NMDA receptor and binds, the NMDA receptor won't open because there is still this ion in the pore blocking the channel. The NMDA receptor is a channel that needs, um, that, uh, that is kind of a coincidence detector. So you need a certain input to a cell, plus you need activation of the NMDA receptor. The first input of a cell would depolarize the neuron. And by this, you kick out this, this ion of the pore. And only now the NMDA receptor would be able to be activated. So you need a certain kind of co-activation until an NMDA receptor is activatable. And by this coincidence detection, so whenever you have input of neuron one, input of neuron two, this is the situation where NMDA receptors can be activated. And then the postsynaptic cells uh, are, um, are recruited very strongly because you have two inputs. And by this uh, strong inputs of two synaptic inputs, the postsynaptic cell can basically um, stabilize these synaptic weights so that the, the postsynaptic neuron knows, ah, 
if, uh, if, if a certain situation where those two inputs were active at the same time, they must be related to each other. So you can scale those synaptic weightings exactly to that certain situation. And that is basically the fundament of synaptic um, plasticity. There is a certain um, saying which goes back to um, a, a very famous uh, memory researcher, Donald Hepp, what fires together, wires together. And that is basically the ground basis of this is the NMDA receptor and its physiology. Now the question, what has that to do with, the, uh, with dopamine? Well, if dopamine increases the overall activity, then basically dopamine allows more of these moments to happen where you have a coincidence detection. Yeah, so dopamine basically increases the overall activity. And whenever there is a certain input, this will trigger situations where NMDA receptors can be activated and can um, produce this kind of coincidence detection. So dopamine, um, if you want, um, lowers the threshold of these situations to occur. I hope that was understandable and not too lengthy uh, as a response. Okay, thank you. We have two more questions currently. And the next would be, have you looked at how dopamine represents stimulus when the reality is better than the expectation, especially from aversive prediction to re uh, reward? Uh, excellent question. No, we didn't. Um, but that, that raises a very fundamental point. So now we, we basically looked on dopamine as the reward center. Actually, a reward center is a long traditional word for the dopamine system, and it uh, couldn't be more wrong. It, it's not the reward center. It's more a center for motivational salience. So it basically, uh, or, or prediction system. Huh? And uh, if something is uh, better than you predicted, then dopamine is released. And of course, that's something where it's like a um, joyful surprise that something is better than predicted. But the system works exactly also in the other side um, uh, that if something is worse than you predicted, the dopamine system also reacts not by increasing dopamine, but by reducing dopamine. And that is, uh, some people call it a micro depression. So you're, you're disappointed about what was going on. Uh, so it's worse than predicted. And this reduction of dopamine may also lead then to, of course, different kind of activation of um, um, the, the corresponding neuronal circuits. And you, you now not increase synaptic weighting and synaptic reconnection, but you would reduce whatever now was active. So the idea is that in situations where something, something is worse than predicted, that this would uh, force you to not repeat whatever you have done the moment before, not to avoid a situation like you experience it now. Um, so dopamine basically is not only um, um, changing synaptic weights when something is positive, but whenever something is not as expected goes in both directions. Um, and if you carefully look on the, um, the, the design of our experiments, we used food shocks. Obviously, this is nothing where an animal would say that's better than predicted. Yeah? A food shock is an aversive event. Um, and of course, in the first moment where you receive a food shock, that's nothing where dopamine is released. Yeah? Because dopamine is released in moments where something is better than predicted. But if there is an unpredicted food shock, you would for sure see a reduction of dopamine in certain neurons. Um, but as you have seen in this one slide where I was showing that at the very beginning of the training, you see an increase in dopamine. That is basically when the animal actively avoids a food shock. And that is something which is good for the animal. So the animal is doing something, avoids a, a, um, an aversive event. And the avoidance of an aversive event for the animal, of course, is something which is better than predicted. So by this the dopamine system uh, is always recruited in, 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 in both of these aversive or appetitive designs and is not only related to reward. That's something which is, I think, very fundamental. Good, we have two more questions. 
can we say that the level of uncertainty the auditory active avoidance task is inducing then is the shuttling across each zone B due to the anxious behavior? Well, to a certain degree, yes, I wouldn't call it anxious um, because it's known that if you have a high level of anxiety, this is what neuroscientists would frame or phrase as fear conditioning. Uh, this is where, where uh, there is not a lot of dopamine activation. You have not only dopamine as a neurotransmitter system, but there are gazillions of different kinds of neurotransmitters uh, and also different kinds of um, neuromodulators, as we call them. And one, one very strong system uh, comes from the amygdala and is uh, the stress system. So you have a release of stress hormones like corticotropin releasing factors. And um, if, if you have a, a situation where anxiety is really, really triggered, like fear conditioning, you have a very strong um, um, food shock. Now uh, we're using very, very mild food shock. They're, they're, they're not creating uh, a pain, only a certain level of discomfort. But if you would increase the food shock strength, the situation, the, the, the emotional situation for the animal would change completely. You would have uh, so-called fear conditioning animals would start to freeze. So they really like shaking and they're shivering and would not be able to solve this more complex task. So there's a certain um, balance you have to find between certain level of discomfort, but also the chance for yourself to solve that kind of um, um, challenging situation by yourself. And when you create this where the animal is able to um, uh, self-develop a strategy to solve the task, this is the moment where I would not uh, say that the animal is anxious, but it's actually, actually actively able to solve an unpleasant situation, which uh, helps the animal to, to develop this kind of, let's say, new world model from detection to discrimination. But I would agree that this certain level of discomfort creates a moment where the animal needs to find new um, strategies. And once it's finding the new, new strategies, this is also a rewarding phenomenon for the animal. Yeah? So it can basically um, um, uh, uh, escape of this certain um, uh, threatening situation. But it's important to see that this kind of um, carrots and stick situation. Yeah? So there is a certain uh, amount of discomfort but there's also the opportunity to receive an own uh, reward by, by avoiding an unpleasant situation. This is a very tight moment where, where these two things work together. When you increase the unpleasantness of a situation and you uh, create pain or fear, there is a block of this dopamine system because the stress hormones would really control the entire activity of the system and this would basically then really diminish the learning or at, 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 at least the the successful development of a new learning strategy what what you learn in this situation of course is that sound is bad uh, so um, let's say um, post-traumatic stress syndrome now uh, ptbs it's basically understood as an overactivation of the stress system that fundamentally implemented that stressful situation to your brain so you, that you cannot think about anything else than this stressful moment. It has nothing to do with dopamine, has only to, to, uh, to do with stress hormones, but it's also kind of a maladaptive learn process if you want. Uh, so you're not able to forget this stressful moment anymore, and this sits in your head all the time. Um, but that's important to understand that flexible change of uh, 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 learning strategies, world models, and so on. That has something to do with dopamine, while anxiety-driven learning, this comes only from stress hormones. Okay, Max, we have eight more minutes um, and two questions. Let's see whether we get them both. Okay. Can we then interpret changes in science during various cognitive, cognitive tasks as biochemically reflected in changes in levels of dopamine? Would these changes occur only in the regions being activated during the cognitive task? Or would the levels of dopamine change throughout the brain, cortically and subcortically, independent of the type of cognitive task? Excellent question. 
And I would say, yes, indeed, that's happening. You would have a change of dopamine everywhere, but only where you also recruit, in addition, uh, 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 neurons by, let's say, sound, there you have this coincidence of the dopamine level and the activity of neurons, let's say, by a sound. While in the visual cortex, you would also have an increase of dopamine, but if visual cues are not the cues that you use for solving the task, nothing happens. Now there's a certain level of dopamine that is increased. There might also be some more activity in the visual cortex, but as long as you don't have certain aspects of visual processing that would specifically change the synapses in the visual cortex, you would only see um, plastic changes of uh, synaptic circuits in the auditory system. So by that, dopamine is released everywhere, but only where you have a coincidence of relevant cues, you will have synaptic plasticity. Good, final question. Given the response of astrocytes to dopamine release, do you have any evidence from your experiments of a mediation of auditory inputs by astrocytes? I love that question. This is a killer, uh, yes. Excellent, very good question. Indeed, we know that astrocytes play a fundamental role in uh, neuronal processing. And I think it's really like, a, at, at least for me, it's a black box. We never had a look uh, on, on the role of astrocytes. So we cannot really dif differentiate what of the signals we see is uh, to what degree related to astrocyte physiology. Um, but it's more and more understood that at least for these long-term changes like dopamine is doing, there must be some kind of buffer of ions buffer of processes at all these synapses. And also when you have synaptic plasticity, you have to, um, to get rid of the extracellular matrix to free the synaptic context so that they could rearrange. That's something where astrocytes are very well known to play a fundamental role. And so my gut feeling is, but I have no strong evidence, at least from our data, that dopamine will also activate and uh, play a role for the astrocyte physiology. Um, but to what degree or, or in, 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 in what relation this is to the learning related uh, plastic changes, I don't know, we don't know. And I think this is like a really nice and uh, fruitful area of further future research. Okay, many thanks Max to the, uh, for the talk. And I hope that we see each other quite soon again, maybe for a beer and good luck in Berlin. Thank you very much, Misha. Uh, thanks for all the people um, attending. There was a, a nice discussion, nice talks. And uh, yeah, so um, good evening and a good day to around the globe. And uh, thanks for attending. And yeah, Misha, hopefully see you for a beer soon. <laughs>